But uh, I asked, what are you looking forward to this year? So same thing. What are some of the things you're looking forward to? For some of us, um, you know, maybe it's um, friendships. Maybe it's trips. Maybe it's, I don't know if they're are they expecting weddings, but maybe. Maybe. Um, babies, definitely, we're looking forward to. Um, some of us have started school, and we're already looking forward to no school. Um, but all of us have something we're looking forward to. Last time, or last year at this time, we were at, if, if anyone knows, I'll, I'll give you a prize next week. No? We were at Kinsman Park last week, or last year. And um, we would go on to meet for another, I think, six weeks. And it was super cold, and we were looking forward to getting inside. <laughs> but we didn't have a space yet, so we just kept going at her outside. <laughs> But uh, we were looking forward to, to warming up, and now we're looking forward to cooling down. We're inside because it's got AC today. Um, this past summer, we were looking forward to meeting people in the parks. And uh, I just have some, some pictures. These are some of my favorites from the past. This is all from last week. I had more the other week. But um, yeah, just hanging out with people in the community and, and, and meeting with them. That was something that we were praying about and looking forward to doing. So when we look forward to something, two things happen. One, as, as we look at whatever that is, we begin to anticipate and we plan and proceed accordingly. Okay? Does that make sense? Another thing happens in that the event or what the thing we're looking forward to gets bigger as we get closer. Does that make sense? Okay? So think of um, Alicia's here. I'm not a girl. I don't know how this works. But <laughs> I'm assuming <laughs> as you, as you kind of like go through the double doors and you see Jared. And um, I don't know what's going through your mind, but I'm sure you have thoughts. And as you get closer, um, he's getting bigger into your, your field of view and you begin thinking and planning and you're doing things. Does that make sense? So as you get closer, you, um, your anticipation grows. Okay? Um, whether that's a wedding, whether that's a concert. I know Mike's been to a few concerts, I think, just from Facebook. Um, or whether that's a movie. The event occurs and it either meets or falls short of expectations. Right? If you're thinking about movies, um, Thor, Love, and Thunder, I was so excited for, and it fell very below expectations. But here, we just read, uh, this is a common story, but for the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, the thing that they were most looking forward to was what? Anybody. Freedom. It was getting out of Egypt. Okay? They were looking forward to it. They'd been there for 400 years. Um, and more recently, they were slaves and they wanted to leave. Right? So God finally sends Moses. Uh, thanks, Shay, for reading that. <laughs> she asked me, how do I pronounce these? I'm like, you know what? Nobody else will know. Just try to sound Jewish. <laughs> Whatever, you, whatever you're comfortable with. Just try your best. <laughs> and I think she did a good job. Yeah, that's the, that's the point. <laughs> so God sends Moses to help them get free, and the event gets closer and closer and closer. Um, if you've watched Prince of Egypt or read the Bible, okay, there's these, these different things that happen. You know, at first the water turns to blood. And then there's frogs, there's lice, there's flies. Um, there's a problem with the livestock. There's boils. There's hail. There's locusts. Lots of bugs. Um, and then there's, like, lots of darkness. And then finally, this last straw, it's um, every firstborn child in every house dies. And it's here, finally, after this Passover that they get to leave. So as a remembrance of this occasion, every year they are to celebrate their freedom with 
unleavened bread. And what, why was a, uh, why is it unleavened bread? Did anyone get that? Because they were in a hurry, guys. They didn't have time for it to rise. It's <laughs> if they waited for it to rise, they would still be there. <laughs> so the importance was, was urgency, okay? <laughs> the, the second thing was uh, they were celebrating freedom with the lamb, okay? And the lamb helped them what? What happened with the lamb? Anybody? They, they what? They killed it. Yeah, yeah. and they, they, they put the blood everywhere. What are the, why? Why? Yes, and they wouldn't die. Yes. <laughs> I just want to point out, five minutes ago I asked Mike if he learned something. He said no. It's because he already knew. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so hold those thoughts. They're really important. Fast forward over 2,600 years later, okay, and this is where we're going today uh, with our text. The Jewish people, they're still observing Passover, except now they're anticipating their liberation from the Romans. And in this context is when Jesus arrives. Uh, John 1, if you guys have your Bibles, uh, you want to turn to John 1, it's near the last third, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or just type in John 1. And uh, here, as you're looking up, we read the account of John the Baptist, his first encounter with Jesus. And this is significant because up to this point, John had invested his entire life for this moment, anticipating this moment. Okay? So John 1, starting in verse 29 to 34. We read, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about blindness and seeing Jesus. We've talked about the last couple of weeks. From this text, we ask what happens when you can see Jesus and not only can you see Jesus, but he's getting closer. It's really important. From our text, we, we find that there is fulfillment when Jesus fills up our vision. Okay? There is fulfillment when Jesus fills our vision. We read here how John experienced fulfillment in purpose. I want to remind everyone he dedicated his life. He dedicated his life to baptizing people. I want you to think about this. He dedicated his life baptizing people with water in preparation for the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. He didn't know when it would happen. It says here he didn't know who. But such was the urgency and the importance of this purpose that it was his priority to be at the Jordan baptizing people in anticipation for this coming moment, this coming time. How important? Well, it was more important than looking good or grooming. If you ever read like a description of John, uh, Matthew, it gives a 
probably the most descriptive version of him is he wore clothing made of camel's hair and he ate locusts and wild honey. He was this wild guy. If you've seen uh, The Chosen, uh, they just call him Crazy John because he looked crazy. <laughs> but he was crazy because he didn't have time for that. He had something that was important. And he went to go do it. It was more important than having other relationships. It was more important than um, having a job that his society would look at. Doing this, being there, and waiting was the most important thing for him to do. He dedicated his life to it. He dedicates his life to this because he knows that Jesus is greater than him. He says that. And even though he's just seizing Jesus now for the first time, he's filled with this fulfillment and this peace that Jesus is before him. Jesus is greater than him. And so to be here this whole time is not only worthwhile, but fulfilling. Earlier in John 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. And so John waited on God. He anticipated his arrival and dedicated his life to wait. Because of this, he was highly regarded by Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 11 says this about John. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. See, crazy John, even though nobody else understood him, he had all his priorities in order. So when Jesus comes... He experiences fulfillment. Jesus gets closer. He experiences even more fulfillment. He knows that's why I'm here. All the waiting, all the name calling, all the other missed events, this is why he's dedicated himself to this purpose. Not only to see Jesus, but to see Jesus closely. John experiences fulfillment in God's presence. He sees the Spirit and hears God's voice. And notice the effect of these two events. He doesn't scan and ask, who said that? Where is this voice from heaven? I don't, if you guys are like me and there is a voice from heaven, I would probably look around <laughs> I would probably be distracted and try to figure it out. Notice he doesn't fumble around and fix his hair, like check if he has locusts in his teeth. Um, in our common day and age, he doesn't like try to pull out his phone and take a selfie of this momentous occasion. He doesn't do any of these things because all that matters is that he can see Jesus. And so when Jesus gets closer, he has confidence to declare, I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Um, to say in this context that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that Jesus is God. Uh, we did this last year, no, no, earlier this year. Note the son here is not this biological term. But more it is of the same substance. As in, bishop is my son. We are the same. When we talk to, when you speak of one, you're speaking of the other. And in this context of son, it's to be sent out. And so Jesus is sent by the father. And we're reminded Jesus' words to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the father. To Thomas, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him because, Joey, you have seen him. 
When you see Jesus, you see God. That's the point. So to see Jesus closely is to see God closely. Think of the significance of this moment, not just for John who gave his life for this moment, who knew the Torah, but think of it in the context of Moses, who after the Passover and in the wilderness, not many people are called a friend of God. Moses is. And Moses wasn't allowed to look at God. He wasn't even allowed to look at God's back without covering his face. Think about that. John sees God face to face. For John, he looked into the eyes of Jesus and nothing else mattered. He was fulfilled because he was just in God's presence. Enough so that he says, behold, Jesus fulfills. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, Jesus who takes away the sin of the world. This word behold is to say, see? It's to, to point out or to show. It's to say, look over here, look over here, look over here. All of you with kids or who have been around kids. They do that to get your attention. It's, it's not a, an issue of blindness as we were talking in the last couple of weeks. But it is redirecting our field of view. Redirecting our gaze. Not there, but there. Behold. You're looking the wrong way. Behold. This lamb, Jesus, takes away the sin of the world. I was uh, speaking with someone the other, the other week, and I was trying to describe sin. And uh, sin's really easy to describe if you're talking to other Christians. <laughs> um, trying to describe sin without using the word sin when talking to non-Christians is, is really hard. Well, I like to think of it this way and, and from this text. You know, when we look away from God to seek fulfillment, to seek purpose, to seek all these other things elsewhere, away from Jesus. Think of um, a wedding. You know, the bride comes in. What's that commercial? Like, while everyone's looking at her, she'll be looking at him. Is that Dirks? I don't know what that is. Some, something for weddings. But it's appropriate because, like, a bride doesn't come in and, like, she's looking everywhere but the groom. She's not, like, high-fiving the people on the side. <laughs> um, she's focused. She's intent. She knows why she's there. And she's looking at the groom, hopefully, God willing. And in the same way, you know, if we would start off a marriage looking elsewhere, you know, pausing for a glance here, maybe stopping a chat on the way with uh, an ex-boyfriend there. Like, none of this makes sense, right? It doesn't happen. And you know, that's what we do with Jesus. It's, it's not so much this do's and don'ts. It's um, we not only get distracted, we sometimes completely change our field of view to look elsewhere. And the cost of this is, is death. It's a relational death. And because God is spiritual, it's a spiritual death. And because Jesus 
created the world. It's a physical death. It's to look elsewhere where things will fade, where things will die. John writes in verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. Jesus is the author, creator, and perfecter of not only our life, but our faith. He creates, and to look elsewhere for fulfillment is to look for purpose in things that will not fulfill. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. Whereas over 2,000 years ago, for John the Baptist, the firstborn of every Egyptian household died. And here, God willingly, lovingly, sacrificially gives his firstborn. That's the meaning of Jesus as the lamb. We are marked. He takes away our sin. He takes away the cost of this relational death. He takes away our shame. He takes away our fear. He takes away our guilt. And he says, just come. Let's look at each other, Mike. Behold. Look to Jesus. The Passover was something that they continued to observe. It was a cause for celebration. It was a cause for worship. That's why they were told to do it over and over again. And when Jesus comes into view, he exceeds expectations. The sacrificial lamb was used to not only remember the marked doors, but the meat was used to remind the Israelites of their deliverance. Here John says, look, as we see Jesus coming closer, as he's getting bigger, as he's filling up our view, the truth comes fuller into who he is. And this lamb is not just worthy for this generation of those seeking to leave Egypt, but it's worthy to take away the sins of the world. Sit there just for a minute and think about that. Is that not cause for celebration and remembrance? See, with Jesus, there is fulfillment. Sorry, there is fulfillment when Jesus fills our vision. And so today, I want to ask you, are you fulfilled as we move into this next season? I want to ask you, what are your distractions or priorities today as you sit here and you listen? What are you looking at? As we, know, as we don't just look at today and we look at this season, I want to ask you, what have you dedicated or what are you dedicating your life to? And in pursuit of whatever that purpose is, I want to ask you this. Listen closely. Is Jesus getting closer today? Can you see him at all? Is there room for more Jesus in your field of view? If there is, I want to encourage you, like Zacchaeus, like the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, like John the Baptist, I want to encourage you to behold Go look. What do you need to do to not only see Jesus, but to see him closely this season? How do you need to readjust your life, your gaze, your purpose? First Peter 
says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. In all your conduct, holy to be set apart. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as his father, who judges impartially according to each one's good deeds, or to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed, ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. There is fulfillment when Jesus fills our vision. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, uh, before you play that Zen, um, here's what we're going to do. Um, I just want to invite everybody to close their eyes. And uh, in a minute here, we're going to play some music. And I just want you to, if there's room for Jesus, if there's more room for Jesus in your field of view, how will you do that? How do you need to get to that vantage point? What do you need to do today? And I invite you to take that time to spend with God. And then when you're ready, I want to invite you to come, grab the elements. Don't partake yet, but just grab them and return to your seat. Then we'll um, have a communion liturgy together.